Hello everyone and welcome to the Autodesk Robot Structural Analysis Tutorial brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. I hope you enjoy the video. Alright, so today is going to be the last video about the pedestrian bridge series in which we are going to apply the loads and perform the design of the bridge. Before I start, there was a little discussion that went between me and my dear subscriber Nisapai about the lateral bracing. And the idea was that our dear subscriber mentioned that the uh, brace, the beams here might need lateral bracing and the reason behind the lateral bracing was explained in one of the previous videos in which I explained that a beam is under a compression stress in one half and a tensile stress on the other so it's usually dangerous to have compression without any lateral bracing. Now of course this compression is always on the top if it is simply supported and as, it, as our desubscriber Donald Khanya mentioned could be reversed if you have a continuous beam because in the continuous beam you would have a negative moment above the support in which case the compression would be on the bottom of the um, beam. Now I mentioned and thought about the idea that the slab might cause lateral bracing for the beam however I stand corrected after I actually did some research and dug up some stuff uh, yes, indeed, the lateral indeed the slab does provide the lateral bracing for the beams, but this is the case if you have a diaphragm or at least if you have a big slab, a big slab that is connected to multiple columns and shear walls where the slab is actually stiff enough to hold the beam in place. Now the problem here is this slab is being carried by the beams, so the beams are carrying the slab, and uh, in a sense, if the beam moves to the side. The slab will move with it. There is like there is no anchorage. I mean, yes, the slab is connected to the shear wall, but you get the idea that this is not a full structure where you have uh, high stiffnesses in both directions. It's just a slab that is above the girders. So it's kind of a puzzle for me, to be honest. And I went and checked out the ASI code. Now, the ASI code doesn't mention exactly when to assume that a slab is indeed bracing the beam. That is not... Uh, written in the ASI code. Of course, I'm trying to make my uh, videos code neutral, but at least in such cases, you know, when you have a question uh, that is that needs a decision, this is where I have to mention codes, because the idea of bracing and the nuances, nuances that are related to this is code neutral, but then you need in the end a number to abide by. I checked out the ASI code. Now, this is not a code I can show, but this is a website that takes outtakes from the code so I'm allowed to do this based on the copyright laws. So there is, and now I have the ASI code copy at home. It's exactly the same wording here. It says that if a beam is not continuously laterally braced, that's the worst case scenario. Because remember, I'm saying that this may not be enough to produce any lateral bracing, the slab. So assuming worst case scenario, assuming that this slab doesn't provide any lateral bracing, the code does talk about this. It says that, if a beam is not continuously laterally braced, A and B shall be satisfied. There are two things. Now, the important point to our discussion is point A, because point B is another thing, but I'm talking about point A now. The spacing of lateral bracings shall not exceed 50 times the, the least width of a compression flange or face. Now, there is no flange here. There is some nuances here once again, because it's really deep. Like, you think that I could just hand wave it, but I don't. I don't want to do that. So it says 50 times the least width of the compression flange or face. Now if you go here, uh, this is a rectangular beam, but if you, of course, cast the deck slab with the beam monolithically, or provide some sort of shear connection between the deck slab and the beam, then it becomes a T-section, and the extension of the flange in the T-section is calculated based on the uh, provided guidance in any code you have. So you could assume it's a T-section, but then of course you're assuming that the deck is being cast monolithically or being well connected with the beam. Worst case scenario is that the beam is not well connected to the slab. In that case, your compression flange is actually the width of the beam. If I remember correctly, I think the beam was 300 by 500. Let me just check. Um, 350 by 700, okay. <clears throat> I forgot. Now what does the ASI code say? Uh, the ASI code says 50 times the least width, so 50 by 0.35. So if you open the calculator, 15 times 0.35 is 17.5 meters. ASI code allows you to have 17.5 meters 
unbraced length for a beam. So, of course, you need also to check uh, part B. Now, notice that we are doing a um, conservative assumption that there is absolutely no lateral bracing. And I told you about the ideas and that why I actually do not have a real solution for you. Like, I do not have a concrete recommendation here because there are so many things that depend on uh, assumptions and on the way you are implementing your assumptions. So, I will use for worst case scenario and choose 50 times. According to our calculation, this is around 17 point something meters. Now, let's take a look. If you go to Tools, Dimension Lines, and just select the dimension line from here to here, then you get a length of 16.43. I think this is incorrect. should be more. But I mean, still, it's below 17.5. Since it's below 17.5, I do not need lateral bracing. All right, so this ends lateral bracing thing. Now, I want to apply my loads. I have dead loads and I have live loads. Live loads are, of course, according to the pedestrian guideline as well as a truck if it is possible. Now, I'm assuming that in both cases there is no truck, but I will, I will just show you a place. I will just show you how the truck is done, even though it's, as you can see, there is no way for a truck, maintenance truck, to get on top of the bridge. So first things first, um, we are focusing, please notice, we are focusing on the bridge. So those support, those side structures, I modeled for you to realize how it actually connects to the bridge. Also notice that there is a structural joint between the, the side structure and the bridge. You might not need this, you might assume that it's one structure. I use a structural joint here because I think that the behavior of the bridge is a tad different than the behavior of a simple staircase. So as much as I want to leave it for showmanship, I will not be implementing anything on this. So let me state my intentions here. My intentions is to apply loads on the bridge itself and uh, tell you how it's designed. The design for each element of those elements is covered in my videos and I will mention those videos when you reach uh, the position of those elements. And that's the reason why I had the robot basics. Uh, for a bridge, of course, you have a multitude of, is this a bug? Okay, so I need to delete this very quickly. I go to cases, eliminate this case, eliminate all those little cases, and eliminate the geometrical object. Now, to be able to focus on the bridge, I will delete all the irrelevant things of the bridge and talk about the relevant bridge. So I'll delete those things because it's not part of my scope now. I will also delete the two staircases and focus entirely and squarely on the bridge. So there we go. Why did I model the circus and the supporting structure in the beginning? Because remember, uh, it's not just here is the bridge, let's do it. You need to understand the entire scope of the project. But of course now we are here for the bridge, so the rest of those things is something I will leave for you. Now before I start, I would like to double check my, my analysis. So I put my mesh as being fine and I run the analysis and take a look. Now I, I know what you're thinking and you're right here. Usually the last video in any video series is somehow boring because like the most new important stuff has been covered and the only thing that I do in the last video is basically to clean up. So anyway, um, we have our structure. Let's take a look on the diagrams from Emperor just to make sure everything is fine. Simply supported moments I should see. I don't see them. So what gives? There is no simply supported moment. Okay. I am checking my load table because I am guessing that there is no self-weight. There is self-weight. I know what, I'll delete the entire loads and apply them myself. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, see there was a bug. So let's go back to my load, select uh, self-weight and masses and apply the self-weight on the entire structure. I think that was the bug. Run the analysis again. Diagrams for members. MY, let's normalize that thing. Um, it's a continuous beam. Strangely, I wanted it to be simply supported, right? Okay, so, I think I've done this in one of my videos, so I'll have to do this very quickly. I'll basically uh, release the ends of that beam. So let's do that. Let's go to beam, let's go to geometry, releases, and release the end or the start, depending on how you click, of that beam. So I'll open the beams to facilitate selection. See, that's why it's always important because look, when you are working on a large project, you might need multiple days days in modeling those projects. So it's usually good practice to, uh, whenever you open the file, to double check very quickly uh, what you've done. 
basically, just to make sure that you're not missing anything and that what you see is what is actually what you want. So running the analysis again, I think now I have simply supported moments with some discontinuities due to the fact that you have also shells here that do uh, re resist some of the moment. Now I've talked in detailed uh, in detail about why those moments exist and how those moments take place. There was a still there was one thing. Our dear subscriber Jesus uh, Jesus Candia. I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name. Jesus. Uh, or Jesus, it depends on uh, on on the country, uh, Candia. He was mentioning that there is some uh, awkward, arbitrary moments that are created in the beams even when you release them. I think, and that's exactly the case what you see here, which is odd and strange because uh, I think I released it right. So what gives? Why do you have this now? I don't. Let's take a, let's take a look why. If you open Maps MXX and click on Apply button. You see that there are some moments in the slabs, but it shouldn't be, right? Like, they should be released. Well, the problem here is, and I will tell you why, if you go to Results, Panel Cuts, and cut yourself a panel uh, parallel to XZ, so there we go, and you hit Apply button, and you make sure that you see the moment on the cut. So, what's this cut? I don't need this, let's delete that. And you check, it's moment XX. You see that... Wait, what? I think I messed up. So let me delete everything. Okay, fine, I'll do it again. Let's define another panel cut here and hit the apply button. It's parallel to XZ. There we go. Okay, so you see that even though you release the beams, the uh, bridge slab itself does have moment. And that's the problem because you see uh, there is moment in the slab that needs to be transferred to the beam. And that's why the, the reason why you still see, at least in this case, why you still see moments although you released. And the crazy part is that those moments actually die out. Like here you have moment and at the release they become zero because they are released. So it's the slab beam interaction that causes those moments. Of course, is this accurate? Well, it depends to be honest. It's not like, it's, look, the idea when I say it depends is not really a, an attempt of me to run away. It's an attempt of me to make you understand. The idea is that, and that's why I will only mention this now. I will not talk about the edges. The idea is that uh, what you see here is that the beams are assumed to be simply supported, meaning that each one of those gets one span at a time. And the release is done in such a way that it releases the moment and not the shear. And there is a difference between those two things. Allow me to show you a full release versus a moment release. If you have a beam and this is a side view, and another beam on a column like this, this is a full release. This is a full release because whatever axial force you see here does not get transferred to this. Whatever shear force you have here does not get transferred to this. This is a full release, and in a release, you would have to click on almost every single button on that. What I've done is I've done a moment release. This means that my assumption now is that it looks like this. And now there is a little notch in one of the beams and another notch in another beam, like this. They basically overlap like this. This is what you see. I need to fix this because I think I messed up. This is another way of modeling two beams, of connecting two beams. And it really depends on what you're doing in reality. You see, this type, of, this type of connection will allow for shear transfer. It doesn't allow for moment transfer. It releases moment. So for this, I would, of course, release moments. So my assumption in my release here is that this type. This type was not assumed in the structure here. If you want to assume it, then you have to release everything, including the shears. The second point I want to talk about is, of course, uh, the slab. You see, in both cases, there are two assumptions for a slab. Assumption one is you could make the slab like this, one piece another piece. This is one case. The other case is where you could have one full piece like this, one full piece of slab. Now this is not really common to see one full piece of slab. It's more common to see two pieces of slab and I will tell you why. Of course, does this mean that those are incorrect or correct? Well, I cannot tell you incorrect or correct because in the end, whatever you assume is whatever you have to design. But the recommended way, in my humble opinion, is that to have the slab follow the break in the beam, meaning that you have two slabs now. Why? 
Because the idea of cutting the beam is not only because of simple support and fatigue, that's something I've explained before. No, it's also because of thermal effects, alpha. Because you want to have a little gap here to allow for thermal expansion and contraction. Of course, if you have a gap and you allow this, then you have to release the axial forces, something I have not done here, but I will leave it for you. So, with a gap like this, uh, it helps to release thermal stresses, but of course, to release thermal stresses, you would have to gap the entire thing. You cannot just gap the beams and not gap the deck slab. Otherwise, the deck slab will crack and the beams will not. That's the first thing. The, that also, it works here, similarly, and that's why I'm more or less a fan of this thing. Since you have disconnected the slabs, you need to um, basically release the slabs. You see, every time I think that I'm about to do something easy, turns out that it's always a rabbit hole that I dive into while talking about. There was a shout out to our dear subscriber, Donald Honey. Uh, there was a video before about uh, influence lines. He basically checked out something called surface influence lines or planar influence lines. It's really nice what you can do if you put your mind to it. It's really advanced and I might cover it later. So back to the point now, we want to go to additional attributes and select linear releases. Now this time, I'm not going to release only the wall. I'm also going to release the deck slab. So I don't know how robot will behave, but I'm afraid to extensively release the deck slab. Now notice it's pinned, but truth to be said, you should release RZ, RX, sorry, and you should release UY, the axial direction, the, the, the direction perpendicular to the edge. I will not do that, but I will just let you do this later. I'll click here to release this. Yes. So now it's applied. And I'll click here to release this edge, like that. And now I run the analysis. If my calculations are correct, this should die. It might be unstable, I don't know. I might have just created the house of cards. Yeah, I create the house of cards, right? It's kind of annoying, to be honest. It's kind of annoying. Now wait, I think I extensively have uh, released this. So let me just remove the release here. So geometry, additional attributes, um, non-linear releases. Let's remove the release here. So delete, and let's select this, yes. And now I have two releases, so this shouldn't take any moment, I hope. It's actually really simple. Uh, if you have an element here, and an element here, and another element here, okay? So how does the moment equilibrium work? It works by saying M1 plus M2 plus M3 equals zero. Now if you release this, then this becomes no longer a factor in the equation. And if you release this too, then this moment becomes no longer a factor in the equation. So now this moment, this moment is zero by release, this moment is zero by release, and this moment is, is zero by calculation. Now if you make a release, a third release here, then this becomes a moment zero by release, so when you want to calculate the equilibrium here, there is no moment to equilibrate. So it's, it's a long story, it's really deep, it's deeply embedded in the finite element method. I just want to say that I extensively released it, so that's why I got punished. And now since we have done it correctly, we are no longer punished. So you can see that now it's exactly behaving as I want it to be with some problems here, but I will leave it because I think you seeing me solve this will give you enough food for thought for this. So yeah, basically now we have a simple supported deck slab and a simple supported beam. So we're not finished because we now need to apply our loads. Right, so how do you apply loads or what are the loads? Now the loads are calculated based on your calculations. You have an architectural drawing and you know what kinds of loads to expect. I'm talking about the dead loads. So I will assume now that I have a, I don't know, 10 centimeter asphalt layer here. I'm assuming 10 centimeter to include all kinds of shenanigans that you can see, like, I don't know, like uh, Crete, because Crete, you could have, you could, for example, make here a little five centimeter concrete uh, layer to fix the asphalt to it with MCO. So I'll assume 10 centimeters asphalt. Now asphalt has a unit weight of 21 point something kilonewton per meter cube. I will assume it to be 25. So 25, I'm just doing a very quick rough approximation because we all know how to calculate loads. That's not a big deal. So 25, that's the, that's the density. Of course, this is an over-exaggeration. You should say 21. 
So this is 2.5, this is for the asphalt. What else do you have here? 2.5 Kn per meter square for asphalt. You might have also uh, some uh, mechanical fittings that run below the bridge. Sometimes you have mechanical fittings running below the bridge. This is usually the case for a highway bridge, but maybe in the pedestrian bridge too. I'll assume 100 kilograms or 1 kN per meter square there. So plus 1 kN for the mechanical fittings is 3.5. What else do I have here? I have the side uh, protection. I will apply this as a linear load. I have the side protection here. And that's it. So let me think. Self-weight, asphalt, uh, mechanical, side protection. I think that's it, but let me tell me in the comment section if I somehow missed something, because I'm just doing it uh, on the fly here. So let's go to loads. Well, 3.5 in the AZ, which is for covering material and, uh, and uh, mechanical stuff. So let's select, let's apply it to here, control here. So if you click apply, yes, you will get, of course, the loads. What about my live load? Well, we go to live load now. Now, this is where things get spicy. Before I go to live load, of course, I go to member load, surface, uh, you could add linear loads on edges, or you could add linear loads to point. So before we apply, go to live load, uh, we want to add the protection load on the two sides. Now I had a nice uh, comment from a deep subscriber, uh, engineer Safiya Munther. She asked about uh, how to apply loads on the plates, and she suc successfully did this even before I explained it, which is amazing, so thank you very much anyway. Uh, she actually solved the problem, which is nice, but still just to mention that you could apply uh, linear loads on two points and you have to define the two points inside the plate. And I'll go to my linear load on edges. Now when you go on linear load on edges, we are going to assume the linear load that is going to be applied on both sides to account for the protection. Now there are multiple ways of protecting people. You could put concrete, you could put steel, you could put a hybrid between concrete and steel. Um, I will assume that you have a concrete wall that is 1.2 meters high with a thickness of 20 centimeters. So it looks kind of like this, 0.2 uh, meters wide and 1.2 meters high. Of course, the length is the length of the bridge. That's my concrete wall. Now, it needs to be designed and not really hard because you can simply put minimum reinforcement here and that's it. Um, also notice that if you have a concrete wall like this, then you have to calculate the wind loads applied on the concrete wall because, um, and this is something I will leave for you, because if you have something that is vertical, then you have lateral wind pressure. So, of course, you could put a steel protection fence, which would really, really, which would significantly reduce the wind loads depending on the size of the openings in that steel grid. Okay, so it's one, it's 0.2 multiplied by 1.2, so the unit weight, so the load per unit length is 0.2 multiplied by 1.2 multiplied by 25 kilonewtons per meter cube. This is 6 kilonewtons per meter. This is the unit load on the length of, of the bridge. We go to robot and 6 kilonewton. I usually like to keep this as video, not unedited, like those mistakes can happen. Okay, yeah, now it works. Those mistakes can happen and I want you to see them. I'm not infallible, you know, so I'm selecting the edge. Now, by the way, if you click here and select the contour, then you will get the load on the entire contour. I don't. I want to select the edge. So I'm getting it on the edge here and on the edge here. And this ends my dead load application. What about live load? This is where things get spicy. So I'm going to basically explain how to apply those loads because the design of elements, as previously has been said, has been covered in the videos that were mentioned above. Uh, walls, walls. Uh, beams, slabs, columns, foundation, all of that has been covered before and you will see the videos popping up on the right top side while I'm speaking. So, we're gonna go to the uh, loads here and I'm gonna assume me a live load. Uh, this is live load 1 and there will be a live load 2 shortly. So what is live load 1? Live load 1 is going to include the live loads as per the pedestrian bridge uh, guideline that I've talked about before. It was I think 4.31 or something. So I'll basically use 5. Now, from the influence line video I've explained before, we know that for this, the maximum values of the forces, since it's a distributed load, is going to be when the entire bridge is loaded, and I'm going to load it right now. So there is no influence lining to be done here. And there is no 
uh, moving load to be modeled here. This is live load number one. But there is also another thing, which is called the maintenance vehicle. Now, truth to be said, my bridge doesn't allow for maintenance vehicles. But I will do one anyway. Now, the specifications of the maintenance vehicles is given in the guidelines. You can see the video linked above. For now, I will just show you how you can move a truck on the bridge without paying attention to the actual loads of the maintenance, just to prove the point. So I'll go to, and of course, I've talked about moving loads before. You can see the videos that are linked above. I'll go to loads, go to special loads, and select moving. Now, I'm going to move a truck. I will not select the H5 because it's not defined. You can define the H5 truck by applying the forces as given in the design guideline. For now, I'll just basically uh, select me a truck from Astro without paying attention to, uh, to the loads because I want to show you, because first of all, it's not actually necessary for my bridge. And second of all, I want to show you how it's done anyway, just to show you. So I'll add this truck, it's already added, fine. And I will use that. Now I am going to move the truck on the bridge. I'm assuming that the truck is moving in the center line of the bridge. So I'll define me here a truck load, a maintenance truck load, maintenance truck load, and define it to be moving on the center of the slab. So from here to here. This is a truck now, and you will know this. It's really cool when you see it. So I'll apply that, close, and run the analysis. So let's run the analysis now. It will take some time because the truck is moving. Actually, the steps of the truck are one meter. I maybe should have done it smaller, but I will just leave it as one meter. It's okay. So let's take a look on the truck. Well, you can see where the truck is. I think you can deduce the position of the truck from the moment diagrams that you see here. And it's, pretty, it's really vivid to see. So allow me to explain here. If you go to right click and select display, go to loads and select loads generated automatically because that's what happens. You click OK. You can see the truck moving. And you can see the truck with its force distribution as you, have, as you have defined it in the truck loads. It's moving on the bridge and its effect is visible on the bridge based on your assumptions and on your moving movement. Now, of course, you can once again make a little animation out of it. So let's select on the animation button and select animation. It's quite amazing to see the truck moving, to be honest. So if you click start, you can see the truck moving from the beginning to the end. Mid diagram responding appropriately to the movement of the truck. Everything is exactly as it should be. And it's kind of surreal to see the truck moving on top of the bridge. It's really cool. Now, uh, truth to be said, where should the truck be positioned? Now, luckily for you, when you design and use this case, we'll design for all load components. But let me just talk about this. Now, the truck to produce, for the truck, for the truck, to produce maximum moment on the span, you would have to put the centroid of the loads in the centroid of the span, which is somewhere here, you know? Like, this is something that you could check out yourself from structures one, and basically, I think this is the maximum positive moment. What about the shear? Well, if you open on the shear forces, if you go to results, diagrams members, and select the shear force instead, then it's a different story. The shear force is different and doesn't happen when the load is in the centroid. It rather happens when the load is on the edge. And of course, you can see the shear force is growing as the load goes to the edge. You can see it here. And of course, uh, basically, you can see all the shear force in any position. Now, do you have to do this manually? Well, luckily, you know, because you're not doing manual calculations. The only thing you have to do is to go to maintenance load positive and you will see the maximum shears on each and every load case, as you can see here. This is the maximum shear that happened on the, on the bridge. So how do you design that? Well, you will create a combination. Let's say you want to design for maximum 1.2 dead plus 1.2 live according to the ASI code. So you go to geometry, no, you go to loads, manual combinations. It's an ultimate limit state combination. And I want 1.2 dead, so 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live notice you have two live loads to account for the maintenance truck and this is like 31 cases in one and this is the pedestrian load if you apply that then and run the analysis let me just check i will know immediately once it finishes then you can see that suddenly the combination has positive and negative if you click on combination 
you will see the combination for a certain load case. You can actually move the truck in with the load. See, the truck is moving and the dead and live are the same. It's really good how robot shows it to you. It shows you 1, 1 1.2, 2, 1.6, and 3. The first case, 1.6, because you can go to the second case and so on. It's really cool. This is the ultimate load. Of course, combination positive gives you the envelope. This is the design thing that you will be using. This is the design envelope for the women's and shears. And this is what you will basically do to design the beam. So you can now use this to design your structure by selecting, for example, the beam and going to design a required reinforcement and so on. And this basically uh, ends my lecture for today. Like, uh, this is all I wanted to talk about today. I know. Uh, Usually the last videos in any series is a little bit uh, like odd and maybe not nothing new But it's usually important to wrap up any video by its uh, wrap up uh, By its finalization video because the rest has been done before the design of beams columns foundation and the report has been done before so take a look on the previous videos to understand how to design those elements for me I think that the analysis of this images is being completed like this, and I am happy with it. I hope you are not disappointed. And well, stay tuned for more videos. I have no idea what to do next, so I'll think about the new structure to tackle in this video series. Anyway, uh, I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. If you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, subscribe, and comment, especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. This is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video.